Thanks, Chair. Um, yesterday, when questions about this at Leaders' Questions, the Taoiseach said, if we pass this bill to reduce rents for ordinary people, there will be no landlords left in Ireland. Across the country, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of people who are struggling to pay 2,000, 2,500 euros in rent a year, others who are living at home well into their late 20s, well into their 30s because they can't afford get, to get out to rent. What those people are thinking is, Taoiseach, don't threaten us with a good time. It was a comment that encapsulated in one sentence the ideology and the approach of the government in relation to housing. That the only conceivable way to provide homes for people is not to consider housing as a basic right, but as a commodity that must be provided for profit in the market. That's the essence of the government's approach to housing. So we have to incentivise developers to build homes for profit by shoveling public money at them. And we have to incentivise landlords to provide the service that landlords provide by not saying that rents should be linked to what people can afford to pay, but saying that landlords are free to charge whatever the market says that they can get away with. That's the essence of what the government's approach is. But it, it begs the question, what service do landlords provide? What wealth do landlords produce in this economy? What added benefit is created by having a class of landlords? Nothing. That's the truth. There is no added benefit by having this layer of corporate landlords in our society. The truth is that landlords, big corporate landlords as a class, are parasitical on the economy. They're taking money out of the economy, generated by workers creating wealth, and keeping it to themselves. A billion euros a year, almost, in state, various state supports, public money going into the <coughs> pockets of landlords. Billions of euros of ordinary workers going into the pockets of landlords. And that's, that amount of money has exploded over the course of the last 10 years. So let's say hypothetically that the Taoiseach is right. Let's say that we pass a law to say that actually that rent should be at a level that people can afford to pay. Very radical idea. And, and let's, say, let's say that the Taoiseach's nightmare scenario is correct and every landlord in the country leaves the market. What are they going to do? You know, pack up the apartments into their bags? Off to wherever they go? Strap the houses to, the, to their backs? Off to America, Germany, where the corporate landlords are based? No, they, they can't take their properties with them. The key point is what will happen to the tenants. But the state can say, the state should say, that for small landlords, we, we have no problem with small landlords. But if small landlords cannot afford to operate on the basis of renters being able to afford to rent and not be crucified, okay, we understand the state should simply agree to buy those homes at market rate from the small landlords who want to get out and turn that into public housing, keeping the tenants in situ. There you go, no crisis. And when it comes to the corporate landlords, to the IRES REITs, the Kennedy Wilsons and the rest of them, well, we think we should follow the example of what the people in Berlin voted to do. Expropriate them. Nationalise them. They're not providing any social use for ordinary people. None whatsoever. We should take them into public ownership. We should turn them into public housing, again, on the basis of affordable rents and create a, a universal model of public housing where housing is not seen and treated as a commodity for profit, but instead as a basic uh, right for people. That's, that's the difference of approach between us thinking about the interests of ordinary people and the government saying we have to shape the market in such a way to enable these people to make as much profit as is uh, possible. And of course, the, uh, there is a happy coincidence between the ideology of the government and the self-interest of the class of landlords that the government represents and the landlords themselves within the government and in the backbenches of the government. Their interests all happens to coincide. 
Because this isn't just a government for landlords, in fact it's a government by landlords. Last night the government won on the motion of confidence by 19 votes. By my calculation, if the landlords in this House had not been voting, the government would have lost that vote. The same presumably will apply when we vote on this rent reduction bill uh, this evening. If the landlords in this House absented themselves, said as they should, well I can't possibly vote on this because this is voting about whether my... Hmm? All, all across the House, you'll find that uh, the, the vast majority of the landlords are on the Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael side and in some of the independents who voted with the government. If, if those landlords, as they should, absented themselves tonight and said, I, I, this is too much to do with me, this will impact my income, clearly it's inappropriate for me to vote, well then, there's every chance this rent reduction bill would uh, pass. I think it's worth looking at who these landlords are in uh, reality. So Rory Hearn did very good work recently outlining the reality of these corporate landlords. So Iris, Iris Reid, the largest private landlord in Ireland, owns close to 4,000 homes. US property corporate Kennedy Wilson owns close to 3,300 rental apartments. Irish property investor Urbio is developing build-to-rent units, advertising a studio in City West, in my own constituency, for €1,500 Euros a month, a two-bed apartment for €2,000 a month. US fund Greystar pre-bought 342 apartments currently being built in Griffith Avenue, advertised for a one-bed at 2140 Rory Hearn also shows that CSO data on new build activity for Dublin in the first three years of this year shows that uh, 1,151 newly built units were sold. Of these, first-time buyers <coughs> bought just 217, 19% of them. Non-household purchasers, overwhelmingly investor funds and REITs, bought 726, 63% of all new builds in Dublin in the first quarter of 2022. And these people, these corporations, are getting massive public funds. IRES REIT got 8.7 million in rental income from the state via HAP in the first half of 2021. Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil have turned the Irish state into a vast funnel through which it can direct public monies to landlords. The Housing for All plan is completely dependent on the private market and on global investor vulture funds in particular. Of the 12 billion euros a year required to build the plan 33,000 homes each year, 10 billion of it will come from private capital sources. Of this, I quote, the majority will be required from international sources coming from well-established investors. So the private market and investors are to provide 83% of new homes with the state playing a small role, less than one-fifth of all new building. Again, it encapsulates the disaster of the for-profit market commodity-driven approach to the housing uh, crisis, which is why the crisis gets worse and worse and worse, day by day, week by week, month by month. I presume, I think we can hit the, the government bingo later on, that you will say this is unconstitutional. It's an interference with the right to private property. Um, we dispute that. Uh, we think the government should do it. And the government should then defend the case in the Supreme Court if that's where it goes. But even if we say you're right, okay, well that's precisely why we have a bill to insert the right to housing into the Constitution. Because we think the vast majority of people out there would agree that the right of ordinary people to housing comes before the supposed right of vulture funds, of cuckoo funds and others to maximise their profits. The final point I want to make is that obviously the government won the confidence uh, motion last night. Um, I still don't think that they have the confidence of ordinary people, and as the slogan of the Arab Spring goes, what the Parliament does, the streets can undo. This is now a weak government. It's a government that can be pressured and pushed from below if we manage to build a cost of living and housing movement like we did with the water charges. Such a movement, which has a protest at five o'clock in front of the Dáil today, and a major national protest on Saturday, September 24th, can force concessions out of this government and will 
at a certain time bring this government down and open the possibility of a government that does not govern in the interests of the big corporate landlords, but instead in the interests of ordinary renters. Taoiseach, 12 years ago I visited the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza. Uh, I was struck by how packed it was. Over 100,000 people living in closely cramped quarters in less than 1.4 square kilometres. Many streets are so small you can't even fit a coffin down them. But today, Tishak, much of Jabalia, a refugee camp, lies in ruins because Israel targeted for bombardment. I visited a hospital in Gaza, Tishak. Even then, back in 2011, they were running out of hospital, of surgical gloves and basic medicines because of Israel's blockade. Today, they are being forced to operate on hospital floors without anaesthetic and are on the verge of running out of fuel. Running out of fuel means the electricity going off and death for people in ICU, for babies in incubators. I met a 12-year-old girl who hadn't seen her father since she was four months old. He was one of about 6,000 political prisoners being held by Israel, many without charge or trial, and hundreds of them children. There are now thousands and thousands of children in Gaza who will never see their parents again. Over 4,000 children themselves have been killed. Israel is committing war crimes, Taoiseach, with the support of the US government and much of the EU. They are bombing hospitals and ambulances. They are bombing residential areas with the biggest bombs designed to inflict maximum damage. They are bombing convoys of refugees they ordered to flee south for safety. They are laying siege to 2.3 million people, trying to starve them out by blockading food and water. They're bombing fishing boats to stop people from getting around the siege and feeding themselves. They are committing the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Article 6, 7, and 8 of the Rome Statute. They are committing these crimes openly and brazenly, repeatedly declaring their intention to do so in the world's media. Yesterday, the Taoiseach said it may well be the case that war crimes have been committed. That is where the International Criminal Court comes in, but there has to be a proper investigation. Taoiseach, will the Irish government make a referral to the International Criminal Court under Article 14 of the Rome Statute so that there can be such an investigation? Israel is facing growing isolation internationally, Taoiseach. Bolivia has cut all diplomatic ties with Israel. Chile and Colombia have recalled their ambassadors. They were joined yesterday by South Africa and Chad. If Ireland took that step as a European country, if we expelled the Israeli ambassador, it would have an impact globally. It would send a clear signal that when Ursula von der Leyen gave the green light to Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza, she was not speaking for all Europeans. It would further isolate and put pressure and on Israel to stop. Time is up. It would demonstrate real solidarity with the Palestinian people. So two questions, Taoiseach. Will the government make a referral to the International Criminal Court so there can be an investigation? And will you expel the Israeli ambassador? The position on this has been very clear. Uh, there should be a humanitarian ceasefire immediately uh, so that aid can go into Gaza and EU and other citizens can leave. Hamas should free all of the hostages it's holding uh, without any conditions and should lay down its arms because it is a terrorist organisation and we need a new peace initiative in the Middle East, uh, desperately so. The situation in Gaza is critical. The high number of civilian casualties is deeply shocking, particularly the numbers of children, journalists and also UN and other aid workers who have been killed. The protection of civilians and de-escalation is a priority. A humanitarian ceasefire is required immediately and the level of aid passing into Gaza needs to be accelerated as a matter of urgency. We continue to engage with EU and regional partners to increase aid allowed into Gaza and the government is in regular contact with regional foreign ministers and leaders. The Taunch has announced 13 million in humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian peace people with 10 million for UNRWA and 3 million for UNOCHA. Ireland condemns, the, condemns outright the attack by Hamas and affirms Israel's right to defend itself, but this must be in line with international humanitarian law and in a proportionate manner, and this has not been the case. A distinction has to be made between Hamas and civilians in Gaza, 
and targeting civilian infrastructure is not acceptable and collective punishment is a breach of international humanitarian law in our view. De-escalation and protection of civilians must be our first priority. In relation to the role of the International Criminal Court, attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure is a breach of international humanitarian law, as I said. All potential violations of international humanitarian law should be investigated. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, confirmed the court has jurisdiction over the situation in occupied territory and by Palestinian nationals outside it, uh, so we don't need to make a referral for an investigation to take place. In relation to the issue of the ambassador deputy, I don't believe uh, it would be the right thing to expel uh, the ambassador uh, from Israel. Um, as I, uh, for exactly the same reasons as we didn't expel the Russian ambassador in relation to, to, to Ukraine, um, we need to be able to engage at some level. Uh, there are 40, around 40 Irish citizens being held in Gaza. We want them to be able to leave. Um, we want them to be able to leave. Look, Deputy, there's also, there's also a, a, a young Irish Israeli girl uh, who may well be being held in Gaza as a, as a hostage of Hamas as well. So let's, let's not just be one side about this. Um, our priority, no matter who's holding them, uh, is them being able to get out and get to safety. And that means that we need to be able to engage with the Israeli government and the Israeli ambassador. We also, at some point, want to be able to talk about peace and reconciliation and reconstruction. And that may seem ridiculous now, but we have to keep that hope alive. Uh, and while uh, expelling the ambassador um, might make us feel better for a day or two, it might be a story in the international news for a day or two, it wouldn't actually have an impact on Israel's policy, not for a second. You're a bit naive if you actually think that. Uh, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't cause them to, it, wouldn't cause them to, it wouldn't cause them to change course. Uh, and, secondly, and secondly, it would hamper our efforts uh, to get the hostages out, uh, to get the citizens out, uh, and also to potentially have some sort of role uh, in future peace building and peacemaking in the area. Deputy Murphy. Please. Deputy Murphy, thanks, Ken Corla. Um, Tisha, you've acknowledged that there needs to be an investigation by the International Criminal Court. It's true that the prosecutor has said that they have authority. What that's referring to is the fact that Israel is not a signatory to the International, to the Treaty Statute of Rome, and therefore is saying we're not applicable. And the prosecutor is saying no, things that are committed in Gaza can be covered. But there does need to be a referral in order for a prosecution and investigation to take place. You have the power to make that happen. Will the government use, make a referral under Article 14 so that there is an investigation by the International Criminal Court? Tijok says we can't expel the Israeli ambassador because we need to have diplomatic relations to try and get the Irish citizens out. But Tijok, we have those relations right now. We have the Israeli ambassador on the Irish media every day telling lies, covering up for war crimes, and that is not happening. Isn't it true, Tijok, that Irish citizens together with Brazilian citizens, are effectively being held hostage by the Israeli regime in Gaza. That while other countries' citizens have been allowed to leave, the US, Germany, Britain, Irish and Brazilians have not been allowed to leave by Israel. Thank you. And that those Deputy. countries whose citizens now, are allowed to leave are those who voted in line with Israel against a ceasefire, and that effectively Irish and Brazilian citizens are being punished by Israel for our vote in okay, favour of a ceasefire at you, the Deputy. UN. The best Thank thing you, for Irish citizens in Gaza and everyone else is for the bombing and the assault to stop, and the more pressure on Israel, the more isolation of Israel, the more pressure put on Israel to do precisely that. The best thing we can Deputy, do precisely please. is to expel the ambassador and to send a signal to them and to the whole world. Tishuk, please. Uh, Deputy, uh, our advice and our understanding is that we don't need to make a referral for an investigation to take place, and the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has said that uh, th they believe jurisdiction applies uh, to the occupied territories, but I'll seek further information and advice on that. Um, there are roughly 8,000 uh, EU and foreign nationals in Gaza. Uh, only a handful have been allowed to leave so far. Uh, only about 20% of EU citizens have been allowed to leave so far, and we've been given no indication that Ireland is somehow being uh, penalised uh, for the stance we're taking uh, in our call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Um, but we will, not, we will not change our position on that, no matter what. Honest, uh, last night, the South African Parliament passed a motion by a large majority to cut all diplomatic ties with Israel, 
and to expel the Israeli ambassador from South Africa. The Dáil should have done that last week, and we have another chance to do it this evening, and we should take that chance. But instead of doing that last week, what did the government do? They mobilised, they whipped their TDs to vote it down. But not just that. What did the Taunish to do? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, the leader of Fianna Fáil. Well, after hosting the Israeli ambassador at the Fianna Fáil Ardesh, the Taunashta went on a trip to Israel, supposedly representing the people of this country. The Taunashta participated in a propaganda tour organised by the Israeli state designed to justify the genocide being inflicted on the people of Gaza. And did the Taunashta, when he was in the region, visit Gaza, where more than 13,000 people have been killed. Almost 6,000 children have been killed. More than one in 200 residents have been killed. No, we didn't. I'm interested in hearing him explain why he didn't visit Gaza. There's one of two reasons. One is that he did not attempt to visit. That he thought it was appropriate to visit Israel to see the impact of Hamas rockets, to point at a ceiling, but not appropriate to go and witness the destruction of hospitals, of apartment blocks, of refugee camp in Gaza. Or the other is that he did attempt to visit and that Israel said no, but that he had nothing to say publicly about that. So I'm very interested in finding out which it is. But Tanishter, your trip to Israel was a disgrace. It was absolutely shameful to be participating in such a propaganda tour while the assault on Gaza is ongoing. Look at the tweets that were put out by the Tanishter. Compare and contrast meeting with uh, the Palestinian Authority, quote, I expressed my sympathy to the Palestinian people over civilian deaths in Gaza. No mention of who caused those civilian deaths, who's responsible for them. Whereas when dealing, when meeting with people in Israel, quote, unreservedly condemned the brutal attack by Hamas, uh, no difficulty in identifying who was responsible. Maybe that was just a slip in a tweet, a couple of tweets that were sent out. But, but it, it's not, because there, there's, a, there's a, an amendment, a counter motion in the Tarnishta's own name, which is very clear in terms of condemning the barbaric attack by Hamas. But when it comes to all the victims in Gaza, what does it have to say? It deeply deplores the catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza, including the death of over 11,000 people, etc., etc., following Israel's military actions in Gaza. Very passive language. Later on, it condemns the, also condemns the killing of children and civilians. Full stop. No, no mention of who is responsible. How is it, Tarnishta, that Palestinians just seem to get killed with nobody being responsible, nobody being blamed, nobody being condemned? And the government's response to all of this, our motion, will be to say diplomacy is key. We cannot possibly impose sanctions and seek to isolate apartheid Israel. But that Tanishta is not the truth. It's not the real reason. And you know that because you can compare the response to Israel's assault on Gaza with the response by the Irish government to Russia's criminal imperialist invasion of Ukraine. Was the Russian ambassador Finitov present at the Fianna Fáil Ardesh Tanishta? Was he invited? Did you go on a propaganda tour to Russia? No. The Irish state expelled Russian diplomats and imposed extensive sanctions on Russia. So what's the difference? Is it the number of casualties? No, it's, it's clearly not. What's the difference? The difference is clear. It's pretty obvious. It's the attitude of the United States. The US supports Israel. It gives billions of dollars, three or four billion dollars a year in military aid. They have greenlit the current genocide. They've increased the amount they're giving, an extra 14.5 billion. Israel is a crucial ally of the US in the Middle East. Joe Biden famously saying that if Israel didn't exist, it would have to be invented. 
So the US supports Israel, whereas it opposes Russia, seeing Russia uh, as a rival imperialism and seeing the criminal invasion, invasion by Putin of Ukraine as an opportunity to extend its own sphere of influence. And the Taunishta, his party, Fine Gael and the entire political establishment see Ireland in the US camp. They want us to be more and more in that camp. They would like for us eventually to be in NATO, but you know you have to move slowly. So in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you've not only imposed sanctions, you've even participated in military training exercises for Ukrainian troops. In response to Israel's genocide in Gaza, what have you done? Words, words, more words. Words attempting to respond to the attitudes of the vast majority of people in this country. Words responding to those who are on the streets. Words to try to make sure you don't pay a political price for the position that you're taking. But in terms of actions, absolutely nothing. Look at your counter motion. Not a single action. Why? Because you do not want to offend the US administration. And Shannon Airport is at the heart of this relationship, both symbolically and materially. Is Shannon Airport being used to transport weapons from the US to Israel? The truth is, I, I don't know. The truth is that the Taunashta and the government doesn't know either, because they refuse to do inspections. We do know that there has very likely been troops going through Shannon Airport to the region to assist in the US agenda of backing up Israel's genocide on Gaza. We know that there's been a significant 50% increase in munitions allowances, indicating an increase in troops going. And we know that the US is the biggest supporter of the genocide being inflicted on the people of Gaza. It is absolutely wrong. It is scandalous that they continue to be allowed to use Shannon Airport. Shannon Airport must be shut down for the US military. The final point I want to make is it's very clear, if you listened to the Taunashta yesterday, he said the reason they're not supporting this motion, uh, we cannot support the mo motion, is because we don't include a condemnation of Hamas. That isn't true. We know it's not true because that's not all you do in your own counter motion. We know it's not true because last week you voted against motions which did condemn Hamas. Well, why don't we include it? Is it because we support the killing of civilians? Of course not. Is it because we support the taking of hostages, civilian hostages? Of course not. Is it because we politically support Hamas? Of course not. Why? It's because we do not accept the narrative that history began on the 7th of October, that all the killings in this year by Israel before then didn't matter, that the 17 years of blockade of Gaza didn't matter, that the 75 years of dispossession, of ethnic cleansing, of apartheid, that none of that matters, none of that is, is relevant. We do not accept that. And this move, moment must be used not only to push for a permanent ceasefire, but to say this is the moment to build a movement that is actually capable of assisting in winning liberation for the people of Palestine. Thanks. After the horrendous bombing of the Baptist Hospital in Gaza, Joe Biden has arrived in Israel. He has embraced the war criminal Netanyahu, and he said, quote, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not you. A disgusting comment in line with the disgusting policy of US support for Israeli ethnic cleansing. Those who have given a green light to genocide by Israel, including Joe Biden, including von der Leyen, have blood on their hands. And the denial of Israel is just part and parcel of the regular propaganda machine. They denied killing Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. They blamed it on the Palestinians for months. In 2022, they denied a strike killing five children in Gaza, blaming it on Islamic Jihad before having to admit it. This is just what they do. We should believe them when they told us what they were going to do. When the army spokesperson said, quote, the emphasis is on damage and not on accuracy. When the defense minister said, we will eliminate everything. When they gave written threats repeatedly to hospitals in Gaza saying, we're going to bomb you. We should believe them. When the Israeli ambassador on the RT radio this morning denied doing it, but said Israel has the right to bomb hospitals in Gaza. It's time for action, Taoiseach. It's time to expel the Israeli ambassador. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks very much, Deputy. Um, uh, Deputy, I raise the issue of, of the UN Security Council. Uh, it's very much uh, our view, and I express this view at the UN General Assembly, that uh, the UN Security Council needs to be reformed. Uh, it simply does not reflect the world of 2023. 
uh, the five permanent members uh, are, are the victors of the Second World War, uh, which was a long time ago now, uh, and uh, it's in dire need of reform uh, and legitimacy. Um, but I really think we should all appreciate that there's a lot more to the United Nations than the Security Council. Um, there's UN peacekeeping. Does anyone doubt the value of operations like UNIFIL, uh, which has at least allowed um, people in South Lebanon to lead uh, a relatively normal life most of the time for the past few decades? I know we're very proud uh, of the role that we've played in that operation. Uh, look at the work of UNRWA, for example, uh, in Gaza and the West Bank, um, caring for Palestinian refugees. That's the UN. Look at the World Health Organization and the work that organization has done uh, in fighting pandemics. So I think when people are critical of the UN, uh, fair enough. Uh, be critical of its limitations, be critical of the composition of the Security Council, but don't turn a blind eye to all the other things that the UN does, uh, peacekeeping and the various different UN agencies. It is a valuable institution, I believe, uh, and I'm proud that we prioritize it uh, as part of our diplomacy. Um, Deputy Murray, who asked about my interaction uh, with with the European Union, uh, so, that, so that's ongoing. Uh, over the course of the weekend, while I was in Paris, uh, my team and I were in touch with uh, President Charles Michel uh, to agree the joint statement um, that was released on Sunday, which I think was uh, a balanced one. Uh, and I attended uh, the European Council meeting by video conference uh, yesterday, and that was attended by 27 heads of state and government, also uh, President von der Leyen, uh, President Metzola, and the High Rep. Uh, as well as President Michel. Um, I had a bilateral uh, meeting with President Macron on Sunday, and we discussed this as one of the three main topics. Uh, and the Tanshta is very active at the moment, um, taking a leading role, contacting uh, other, member sta other states, uh, including Jordan, has been in contact with Fatah, has also been in contact with, um, uh, with Iran and others. Uh, Deputy Smith reminds us of the fact that we have uh, citizens in the region, um, and their safety is very much on my mind. Uh, we have peacekeepers in Lebanon and Syria, uh, we have aid workers in, in Gaza, and we have citizens in Gaza as well. Uh, so far, the only person who's been killed, the only Irish person who's been killed uh, in this conflict so far uh, was killed by Hamas, uh, and I think we shouldn't forget that. Um, but of course, um, our citizens are at risk uh, in Gaza, uh, in South Lebanon, in, in Israel, and in Golan. Uh, and I certainly hope there'll be no other Irish citizens killed uh, during the course of this conflict or this phase of the conflict. Uh, Deputy Smith also raised the issue of undo undocumented Irish. Um, I think we have a really good model uh, that other states could follow in terms of regularising undocumented people. Uh, we have done a few schemes uh, in this state, uh, including one for people who uh, arrived with student visas and subsequently lost their status. I think it is a good example uh, for the US to follow, um, but unfortunately I do not think it is going to be possible for them to do so. Uh, the whole, whole debate around migration uh, in the US has become so polarised. Uh, I think it would be very difficult for any president um, or any Congress uh, to be able to get, to, to get a reform through, uh, and that's a real shame, but hopefully that will change at some point in the future. Uh, just w once again to say that um, uh, Israel wasn't invented by the United States, uh, notwithstanding uh, anything that, um, that uh, uh, Dr. Boy Barrett may have, may have seen, uh, it was established by the United Nations um, as a Jewish state uh, in their historic homeland land. And Israel has the right to exist, but it does. But it doesn't have the right. It doesn't have a right. It doesn't have a right. It doesn't have a right to, right to do wrong. Uh, finally, uh, you'll recall that there were many calls um, to expel uh, the Russian ambassador and to close the Russian embassy uh, here in Dublin. Um, and everyone in this house knows that I was 100% on the side, and remain 100% on the side of the Ukrainian people uh, in resisting. Um, occupation and resisting uh, the war that's happening uh, caused by Russia. Uh, we decided not to expel the ambassador or close the embassy, the Russian one, uh, precisely because we think it's important that even in the worst of times, uh, you have to keep diplomatic contacts open.